Why hello there and welcome back to Socket Sanctuary. Today we are going to be taking a look at the NVIDIA GT 1030. However, everybody and their brother has done a review on the GT 1030 so we are going to change it up a bit. So we are going to do a proper review and benchmark of it, just like you would expect, but we are going to include a couple of the GT 1030's friends. However, not the ones that you would expect. You won't see any RX 550, GTX 1050, or 750 Ti. If you want to see a video comparing those, well, there are hundreds out there that you can watch. What we are going to do is compare the per core, per clock, performance, try saying that 10 times in a row, with other cards that have 384 cores to see how Pascal benefits from the upgraded architecture and to see if it's worth getting. How much performance has been gained per core? Is it a legit card for the price, or is it just an overclocked Maxwell card? Well, we'll find out all of that, but before we do, let's take a look at the stats of the new GT1030. The GT1030 is Nvidia's new budget GPU that replaces the well-received GT730. Unlike the 730, the 1030 is all the same SKU, meaning there is no funny business in core counts or GPU dies used. The GT1030 is packing 384 CUDA cores with a 1225 MHz base clock with a 1450 MHz boost. In addition, it has 24 texture mapping units, which is up 8 from the GT730. The GT1030 also has 8 more raster operation pipelines than its predecessor. As for RAM, the GT1030 is packing 2GB of GDDR5 with a 64-bit memory bus and a 48GB per second memory bandwidth. Now with all that said, let's see how it performs in some games. The first game that we tested was Doom at 1080p medium settings. The card handled this game pretty well with a 41 FPS average. Even during the most intense combat, the card would only drop past the cinematic 30 FPS mark. If you're more of an elitist, you may want to drop the render scale from 100% to something a little bit lower to get a higher frame rate. Or you could just drop the settings, but all in all, it runs pretty well in this game. In Grand Theft Auto V, the card performed great at 1080p high settings. With a 56 average and a 39 FPS minimum, the game looks and feels great. Put on V-Sync and you wouldn't really notice any slowdowns, unless of course you are an elitist. Killing Floor 2 is a new game that I have been having a really great time with. Killing zombies has never been so much fun, especially with the new Nvidia Gore mode that can be enabled on the new Pascal cards. With the Gibbs mode disabled, we got a fantastic frame rate at 1080p high settings. Even though we did have a minimum of 34, it didn't drop down that far, that often, and was incredibly playable at these settings. With the gore mode turned on, the game turned into a brilliant bombastic bloodbath. The frame rate did take a hit, but playing it at medium settings with the Gibbs mode turned on would be my ideal way of experiencing this game with this card. In Overwatch 1080p high settings, we got the best frame rate of any game tested. With an average approaching 100 FPS and a minimum that rarely dropped below VSync, playing this game would be a more than smooth experience. Although I suck at this game, it was still a fun and enjoyable experience on this card. Now onto the second part of the video where we compare the architectural improvements of Pascal to the other cards with the same core count. The other cards that we tested were the Fermi-based GTX 560 Ti, the Kepler-based GT730, and the graphics card Next One based R7 350X. All of these cards are similar in the fact that they have 384 cores. All of the cards were also tested at a flat 1 GHz core clock to try and make the comparisons a bit easier. Other than that, here's a page of stats about each card. I could talk until I am blue in the face about all of the architectural differences between all of these cards, but what really matters, what really matters, is how those differences affect the actual performance of the card and their respecting architectures. So, as you can see, I tested all of the cards in the same games at the same settings as the GT1030. In general, the GCN card performed the worst with the Kepler card close behind. The Fermi and Pascal cards traded blows with each other, winning in two games each. Although it does appear Fermi has a strong core performance, it does use far more electricity than the Pascal card. Two 6-pin PCIe power connectors to be precise. 
After all the testing was done, I ran some numbers and came up with a score for the strength of each architecture. After adjusting for the clock speeds on the GT1030, we normalized the score on a 1 to 10 scale, with 1 being the lowest and 10 being the highest. If you're curious behind the math on the numbers, just let me know and I can get into that in a different episode or maybe in the comments, but the card that performed the best overall was actually the Fermi card. Although it did get beaten by Pascal in some cases, the less demanding titles were clearly won by this old architecture. The GT1030 was close behind in per core performance with a solid 7.8. In the more demanding titles, Pascal wasn't hit as hard by a performance decrease, likely due to the improvements in architecture and memory compression. Kepler didn't fare as well at all, with a normalized score of 3.3. Perhaps if we tested the games at a lower setting where memory bandwidth wouldn't play as big of a role, things would have been different. However, in our tests, the GT730 really underperformed compared to its counterparts. It didn't fare as bad as the R7-350X. It's really not surprising that the Radeon card performed poorly, as the GCN architecture is much more known for its quantity of cores and parallel compute, rather than its per-core performance. So, overall, the Pascal GT1030 is a market improvement over the Kepler-based GT730 in core clock, architecture, and performance in general. There is no real reason to pick up a GT730 anymore, unless you can find it really quite cheap. In all other cases, a GT1030 or a used card would be better. If you like these sort of weird tech videos, make sure to subscribe or hit the bell to get notified of any videos in the future. If you think I could improve this, feel free to let me know in the comments section below, I always read them. As always, thank you folks for watching, may your frame rates be high and your prices low, and I'll catch you folks next time.